Just a quick reminder that if you want to support Concepts and Legends, please remember to like and subscribe. And you can also show your support by using our TCG affiliate link for any and all of your magic needs by using the link you see here or below in the description. Any and all help is greatly appreciated and helps us bring you more videos like the one that is starting right now. Hello, mes amis. Anyone who knows art will know the name Julie Bell, and today we will be focusing on one of her most influential creations to date one that has altered the landscape of modern illustration as we know it. Her son, Magic the Gathering artist David Palumbo. David is what we in the upper echelon of art society refer to as putain du talent, or loosely translated, talented as f But just how talented? Let's find out. So, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me today. Hi, yeah, great to be here, thank you. Okay, so there's so much that I want to cover, and I, I, I literally am in full screen, so my questions are being shut down. But so um, the, the first thing that I want to, you know, I guess discuss is um, your, your family background. I mean, it's, it's sort of like you were um, almost like, not almost, like you were literally made to be a, a fantasy artist, it's, it seems regard I mean with your mom and then with your dad and, and then with your stepfather it's like you you almost had to be a, a fantasy <laughs> artist you know what I mean it, um there were there were less obstacles for me than most people yeah <laughs> but it's like uh it's a uh, it's you know I don't I hesitate to use the word bread for it but really I mean it's it's almost it's almost uncanny um when when you grow up in a house full of artists like that how how do you guys manage to be so close knit um, with each other? Because I, I do see a real closeness amongst you, but I would always imagine that there would be um, tension with maybe having to reach a certain level of success. I mean, certainly with the level that your mom and, and Boris got to. Uh, how do you how do you navigate those waters? Uh, yeah, I I don't know that that has anything to do with being an artist exactly i think it's just you know um you know different different people have different family dynamics and ours just happens to to be a pretty close uh you know like um supportive dynamic there uh yeah you know and i i think a lot of that goes a lot of that credit i think goes to my mom um she raised my brother and i in a way that we really just got along we you know for most of our lives there were like brief periods during you know like uh we're two years apart he's he's older than i am by two years so there were brief periods of time uh where like he wanted to kind of have his own friends and it's kind of like figuring that thing out you know but but even that didn't really last very long and for most of the time that like we were teenagers we had overlapping groups of friends and um you know, I just, I think it's, uh, she, she was always really good at like keeping a, a, a kind of like a healthy balance in, in the, you know, family dynamic there so that everybody respected each other and treated each other that way. So yeah, I don't know it's, how it's, she it's, did it. <laughs> it's, 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 I mean, it's thoroughly impressive. I mean, I mean, not to, not that I would, you know, I have any actual authority on it, but it seems like that's some good mothering because uh i i i would i would be like i would be a neurotic mess if i had a, <laughs> if i had another talented person which i'm not talented, but if i did i'd be like i'd have to win no i'm just kidding but am i no not really I mean, um so well and i think that there are there is uh or at times there has been like certain amounts of competition and there were also times when we weren't all necessarily like kind of doing the same thing like my brother and i um when we were both kind of like earlier in that transition from coming out of school and then like starting a career uh we were not necessarily like on the same path uh he was more kind of like moving towards gallery and fine art stuff when he came out of school and i did that a little bit so like there is still like so much overlap like we both showed at the same gallery <laughs> you know and, <laughs> um and there would be like like you said like healthy kind of competition you know uh but um but yeah it was it was always like uh he was doing his things and I was doing my things and then over time 
uh, when when those did start to kind of like come back into a, a similar direction. Um, I guess it was also just lucky, like one person would feel kind of established at that point to to not feel threatened by it. And um, yeah, I mean, I remember like when when we were both in school, uh, like he won more awards than I did at school. And so, you know, I felt kind of like, yeah, oh, that's a bummer, <laughs> you know, but also I felt like, but I've got, you know, I've, I've got these other things uh, that are going well for me and, and that I was excited about. And um, yeah, I don't know. It just, it, it, it always kind of, uh, I think it always just came back to that, like, uh, kind of foundation of growing up in a way that we were not like, pitted against each other and and that we were actually like more like best friends than than rivals so right yeah you can you can even from the photographs that i've seen of you two together there is like there is that best friendy thing i i don't i have a sister i have a younger sister so I, it's a completely different dynamic like i'm always protective and you know the you know big brother but like i've always wondered what it would be like to have a brother and like you guys just seem like brothers you guys are just brotherly <laughs> um and what's uh cool is you both seem to have that uh, even that that interest in, in photography together too which is just fantastic because i don't see enough uh analog photography just just out there yeah it's, it's so nice to see yeah and when and that's something that again like uh i think when we were teenagers we were both kind of into it but we never really dove fully down the rabbit hole and then it was always like a tool that you know i need to know how to you know, use a camera to a certain extent for shooting reference and photographing paintings and things like that. And then I started kind of just getting more into photography as a hobby, as its own art form. Mm -hmm. uh, and I loved old gear, like I would use old lenses on my digital bodies. And I always liked the idea of like, it'd be really cool to shoot film, but oh, what a pain in the ass. I don't want to have to like take my stuff to a lab and everything. And then it was Tony that uh, just kind of I think he was getting into photography again because he was using it for 3D stuff. Like he was doing um, the thing where he, I forget what it's called. He will like walk around a place and take like a thousand photos of this like. It's like panoramic? Uh, it was, no. It's like he's just walking around like taking pictures of everything. Photogrammetry maybe is what it's called, I think. And then he sure. uh, imports them all into a program and it rebuilds the space into a 3D model. Oh. Uh, which is super cool. And so he was like getting into that. And then somehow, I don't know what uh, brought him to it, but he just one day he was like, I think I'm gonna uh, try and shoot some film. Like we figured this out when we were teenagers and you know, we're probably a lot smarter now than we were then. So <laughs> should be doable. And, uh, and then like once he did that and he was like, yeah, I got everything set up in my, you know, in my kitchen uh it's it's like you can get all the chemistry and everything uh, oh you did dark room well so that's that's the part of it that always put me off was like i don't have any place to build a dark room and he's like oh yeah we don't need one you just you just um that's actually what this box here is is uh you can scan uh your film like through a film scanner and no way. digitize it and then uh for things that won't fit in the film scanner if i'm shooting like medium format um I've learned at this point, like it was a little bit of a learning curve, but I've learned how to do that um, with a DSLR. And a lot of that sounds like stupid, like to shoot analog film and then like digitize it. But just having access to, cause for me, like one of the things that I really love about it is uh, a lot of my, my favorite cameras that I own are purely mechanical. They mm -hmm. uh, don't have any electronics whatsoever in them. I I brought and, this uh, to show you because uh, oh, wait, I oops, can't sorry, see. I can't, from... Sorry, wait. Let me see if I can. There we go. Okay. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, it's something where if it's just like just gears and glass in a box with springs and you know all that kind yep. of stuff. And and um, some of them, I was just shooting pictures earlier this week on a camera that is a hundred years old. I'll probably never shoot pictures with it again because it doesn't look very good, you know. <laughs> but but it's the kind of thing where it's just like you find this this old thing and make it work again or it or it still happens to work like so many years later it's just really fun yeah you know? and and it kicks your ass too because i <laughs> you when i got back into doing analog I, lomography is what sucked me in i don't i don't know if you heard of lomography the, oh yeah yeah oh so i got sucked i got suckered in um 
by because uh, Tori Amos released a Diana F plus, and I was like, "What is this camera?" So, but you forget how much that you actually had to like pay attention to what you were doing with analog. Which I, yeah, I, I'm not knocking digital. Digital is fantastic. It's just it really. I wish every photographer that that is out there, and I'm sure they do. Every like photographer probably does, but I wish people could know the the. I guess the satisfaction of being able to 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 to, to handle a uh, film. Yeah, yeah. There's. I mean, I, I think for me it also connects probably in a lot of reasons why I still paint in traditional media. Something about the physical realness of it that appeals to me, and I think, um, yeah. There's there's a lot of intersecting interests for me. Uh, beautifully made mechanical devices are just, you know, wonderful and. Uh, the the history of some of it like when when you find something that's like you know so old and you think of all the different like hands that it's passed through and people mm -hmm. who've cared for it over the years um yeah and then that it's a tool and and that each one has its own kind of unique personality is really fun and the digital stuff is is just completely amazing as far as capabilities but it usually doesn't have like those aspects to it and so mm -hmm. those are the parts that you know if i'm shooting pictures for work I'm shooting digital if I'm if I'm shooting pictures for myself then I want to use something that's fun that that's like I can really engage with like that yeah when I saw one of your photographs that Kodak Triax I was like oh Triax <laughs> like that was that was my photography class like I loved it I loved that stuff it was like you couldn't take a bad photo with those it's like it's, it was just yeah Co yeah the that's that's the one film that's like it'll treat you very mm -hmm. very leniently no matter how much yeah. you're still learning what you're doing yeah right you're like that is a beautiful pete that is a beautiful shot of my thigh that i didn't realize it. <laughs> um so um with your uh your art um your influences i'd say you were were you were you into horror i mean i know that you you're a big fan of alien and uh you're a big fan of of the science fiction but was i feel like horror was a big part of your of your sort of like uh uh, growing up experience is that correct or right yeah i i think growing up it was more science fiction uh than horror and i started kind of coming to horror like mm, in my late teens early 20s so prior to that it was like comic books and science fiction and um yeah and then when i when i started getting into horror uh i still i i kind of like hesitate because i know like horror fans are so hardcore and you know, I I really enjoy uh, certain genres of horror. Uh, there are certain genres of horror that just don't interest me at all. And I haven't read a lot. Like I'm I'm not at all well read in horror. But uh, movies is usually kind of more of my thing. And also just imagery. Like a lot of artists whose work is kind of dark always appealed to me. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet you read Salem's Lot. I did, yeah. Well, so <laughs> when I when I got that project, I did the um, uh, was it for Cemetery Dance, the uh, illustrated edition, mm -hmm. and I had only ever prior to that read uh, short stories from Stephen King, and um, like I'd read some of his novellas, uh, like The Body and The Running Man and Long Walk. Uh, I think was that, it, but but it was like. Did I'm you sorry. read Cycle of the Werewolf too? That was a good one. Like, no, that was a short I don't know that one. It's a, they made it into a movie called Silver Bullet. It's really good. It's only like okay. 150 pages. Yeah. Well, and that's what like I don't know why um, I never like picked up anything longer. I think that part of it was I had a collection of of novellas, and so that was you know what I read. But um, yeah, when I got that project, uh, you know, obviously the first thing I did was sit down and read the book um but that led me to also reading the shining finally which i've, I've which, loved yeah the movie which i and i know that people who like the book often don't like the kubrick movie um or some people you know have strong feelings on that but i think because i i loved the movie for so long and then i got to read the book and kind of appreciate them as just different things you yeah. know uh but yeah I, so salem's lot is great but i have to say uh the shining is is my favorite so far yeah so, yeah it's that they're, they're they can they are autonomous i mean they live in a different like they're they're like 
they're they're of the same like universe but they're just like i i don't understand how people can't uh, see them coexisting i think the only person who i think is allowed to to have maybe an opinion about that would be stephen king himself which i'd be like all right okay he which can do it but i believe he is very outspoken and not yeah. liking the kubrick movie he, <laughs> he know he know likey he know likey yeah. um but um so and i there's some fascinating stuff with that project so um but again with but the horror i feel like though out of i mean and yes your your the the uh, comic book and your marvel work i mean is is amazing i mean the fact honestly though and in general how how many paintings have you done in like total do you have any idea is it like 300 i don't, I don't know oh i mean for for what for everything i mean for everything just, like, i i will because I mean, I, you really do paint a lot a lot yeah so that like i don't know how to answer that question to begin with because like before i was working professionally like i had to learn how to paint and so right. there's a lot of bad work that comes before the okay work what, <laughs> you know? what about what about when you were able to declare on your taxes that you were an artist what about marketing yeah, at that point like, I, I couldn't begin, like, so That's I can a, yeah. tell you just off the top of my head, uh, the Marvel set I just finished, I did 135 pieces, and the other biggest body of commercial work I've done is magic, and it's, I don't know, it's over 100, it's probably yeah. in the, like, 120, 130 range of that, too. I mean, um, and... And the nudes, the nude, uh, and I, I know I'm digressing, and I'll get, bring it back. But, but the nude studies that you've done too, as well, it's like there's got to be yeah, the hundreds, same amount of those. Of those. Uh, easily as much as the two, those two things put together of those. But a lot of those are real small. Um, yeah, and that's another thing about like when you say a painting, like my sketches are paintings these days. I don't think those really like necessarily count because they're they're studies. They're not what I would consider to be like a finished, fully realized piece, but um but yeah i mean that's i i i don't know i uh i realized at a certain point when i was um kind of early in my career and a lot of people were pointing out that working in a traditional media uh is a little bit of a disadvantage um against working digitally just because of how much faster it is to work digitally. And so a lot of the way I developed my process was also developed to be able to kind of like compete. So mm -hmm. um, so I do like my, my process is designed to let me work fairly quickly, which lets me consequently like do a lot of paintings yeah <laughs> so. and then and then i love well i love that you wrote for in in, in the uh, muddy colors that, that you wrote about uh, uh when you have downtime and i was thinking to myself he does he know what downtime is uh because you're writing an article about downtime i was like he's he's writing when he's yeah. like i was like that's it's it's you're prolific to say the least <laughs> thank you yeah uh i think that the 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 most downtime i've had like genuinely like not really painting much was um, the latter part of last year, just because it seemed like a lot of uh, a lot of clients were still kind of like figuring out their production schedules in the midst of COVID, and um, and then that was when Masterpieces was releasing, and so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to just focus on uh, putting making available and uh, managing the sales of my originals for this and that ended up kind of so i mean that wasn't downtime <laughs> because it was a it was a full-time right. job that lasted for a couple of months of, of just kind of like doing that but um but it was downtime in a sense of like i'm just kind of like not painting i'm not doing anything like creative while i'm doing this i um really like it was weird after that was all over with and then uh, a bunch of projects started coming in and I was like, okay, I got to ramp back up into this. It really took me like a couple of months to kind of um, fire up the engines again, like of, of just feeling like, why is this so hard? But it was just because like, I kind of, I kind of got out of uh, my rhythm. And so it took some time to get back into it. Yeah, I mean, you've been you cracked the whip. I mean, like it's it's <laughs> it's. There's some people that you I just see. I'm like I'm like wow. If you could bottle that work ethic, uh, it would be, it would be it, it would be a great money maker. But um, uh, so and I I will bring it back to horror. I will I will circle around. I promise that this will be 
logical. But with uh, I, I was fascinated by what you said about the nudes because they are they are, and I'm not sure because of the YouTube um, if I can even show them because they're 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 a little racy. I'm hoping I can. I don't. There think should that, be you know... there should be some in there that wouldn't be a problem. Right. There's a right. lot that you might. I've, I I would, I did a flip through of one of the books and that got taken down. Like, Let's see. Yeah, and they're giving you crap too, and and they shadow banned you, or what was it? No, that's Instagram. Instagram. That's shadow. Instagram. Yeah, what I think is, that I mean, had to do with hashtags. Yeah, I don't I mean, think anybody's I, ever like flagged me, and I, I right? but you never know what's going on. They mm -hmm. don't tell you, so yeah. I don't know. Like oh, naked bodies. But what's fascinating is that you. I was like, well, I wondered what his what your drive was behind it, and then you said, and this was in one of your articles that the subject the subjects of my paintings exhibit poise and sexual confidence, whereas I've always struggled to understand what it looks like in our culture as a man to simply be sexy, which I find really interesting because um, it well, it seems like. I, that I, I feel like you could you could grasp that because as a an, as an op artist as accomplished as you are that that would be something that you could see is that something that you're talking about with yourself or is that in general? Yeah, that's like that's like just personal feelings. Yeah, I mean, I you know uh, growing up in our you know culture, I've got my baggage like anybody right. else does, and so um what whatever like insecurities those might be and whatever kind of uh just just kind of i mean really i guess insecurities is is the word for it but but just the things that you feel like i don't know how to do this or i don't know what you know what this should be like for me like it doesn't feel like it seems like it, I guess it's the kind of thing where it's like, why? Well, it seems like other people know what they're doing, but I don't know if I do, kind of thing. So and you know, it's funny though, is like if I mean, and this is just, and I'm not buttering your buns, but I am, I am like, like I was just like objectively, I was like, huh? He's he's definitely like he. I felt like you knew what sexy was because, and I, again, I'm I'm trying, I'm not I'm not flirting with the subject, but I was like objectively sexy guy. And then what is also interesting is that one of your favorite um, artists, J.C. Leyendecker, is, uh, um, I feel like his uh, paintings of men would be a perfect uh, example of what a sexy man can look like. Sure, in, in yeah. And I, I think that, you know, yeah, the, so that series has been going, uh, actually, I, I don't know if I should say has been going, because I haven't really been painting anything in that series uh, at all recently. But, you know, that that was something that started uh, in my late 20s. And I just feel like um, I have learned a lot about myself since then. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I... I still like it's sometimes like you think you're kind of like figuring one thing out and then it just brings up a whole bunch of new questions and and part of that might be I think one of the reasons that I'm not really doing uh that many new pieces for that series anymore is is a lot of that stuff has kind of it's it's not that those issues have kind of like gone away from me but they've kind of changed into different things and so I'm not really sure like doing those specific paintings uh is is kind of like connecting for me in the way that it once was there's a lot of things about those paintings that i like from a technical point of view but just from a um kind of uh subject point of view is is not necessarily the most interesting thing to me to be working on and i think a lot of that is why my personal work kind of started shifting towards the the ritual pieces, which I don't know if you've seen, but that's mm -hmm. the, like the ones that are, they're kind of similar because they're still like, you know, like nudes, but in more kind of narrative. There's, yeah. Uh, and, and they're definitely like weirder. <laughs> and yeah. a lot of them are like, you know, for me, like a lot of this stuff is, uh, I'm not really sure what this is about. So I'm just going to work on it for a while and maybe it'll start to make sense to me as I do it. Right. There was, yeah, one piece uh, you talked about, you wanted it to sort of visually resemble the way a twig, uh, you said a twig snapping in like the woods um, would be if that was a visualization. And it and it really, uh, it, it's, I don't know if you saw the movie, The Witch, but oh, yeah. it had, it had uh, that feeling to it. Of, it's, um, it's, that's funny. I just rewatched it uh, uh, this past 
fall. Um, I haven't a good seen it since it came when, when it was in the theater, we went to see it. And that was like right at a time when I was just starting to get into that series. Like I, I think I had painted a couple and I had like a bunch of ideas for stuff that I was working on. And we went to see that movie and I was like, wow, this movie's amazing. I am not going to watch this again for right. at least a few years because this is almost like too similar in some ways. To, to right. What yes. Doing. Yes. And that's where I feel like horror is whether it was something that was part of your um, like whether you were uh, actively paying attention to it. You you have the DNA of a horror artist. And and that is, is a very uh, that's very uh clear in the assignments that you get for magic um mm -hmm. it's 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 like it's interesting because i feel like even though you're you're you may not be a horror fan per se you definitely are of the horror um icon sort of i mean like what I, I i really i don't want to say that i'm not i guess i just kind of feel like um well you're not one of the you know like the people who are like no, that that's not the proper edit of George Romero's. Doctor. Yeah, like I I uh, I don't know to what degree it's part of my identity to think of myself that way, but I mean, I definitely, you know, I like horror movies. Uh, I I've seen a fair amount. Um, you know, I just I'm I'm I, I it's the kind of thing, you know, when when it's like I know there's much bigger nerds than I am so it makes me feel a little bit like right. shy about it oh I mean you, that. you should be able to claim it because the thing is is like the nerds are talking about you because I am a oh, horror well. nerd <laughs> so there you go like because I'm but, like I guess your stuff is just like I'm like wow this guy gets horror and and, and you get it in a way that um that the creators get it. Like you don't see John Carpenter or you didn't see Wes Craven, you know, before he passed away. You did, they, they seem like kind of scholarly guys or maybe mm -hmm. a little bit like weird, but they were not the, the, the typical horror nerd like me with the, you know, the, the, the get up and the, the, the contact lenses and the, all that good stuff. They were just sort of, they just created it. And that's, I yeah. feel like what you do. Which, I, and I think uh, like, I really like to try and figure out why things work you know, and that's something, especially uh, with with stories and movies, um, like my wife and I, whenever we watch something, love to kind of like talk afterwards about like, uh, especially if it's if it's like, boy, that was really good. And the ending just like didn't didn't seem like the right ending. But why? You know, and trying to figure it out and that kind of thing. And and horror is one of the ones that I've just always had a really hard time uh figuring out like i still don't fully understand what the appeal of a lot of it is to me it's it's that kind of thing where it's like there's there's something that's really kind of uh, and and even more uh in in that subject would be like true crime where it's like mm. i i actually feel like really like conflicted feelings about yeah. this is this is entertainment to me that's also like really disturbing that that it can be kind of like consumed in that way yeah. But at the same time, so I, I think that there's there's something about that, which is just kind of like never fully being able to understand, like, what is it about this that's so interesting? And that kind of makes me think about when I, the, the, my, the stuff that I make in a similar kind of way and be pretty kind of intellectual about it in, in some respects. What's interesting is when I was getting my master's in English education, I actually, you did the art you did the artwork for the cover of one of my textbooks for a class on zombies. Uh, and so I actually, back in the day before I'd even played magic, I was, we, we were reading the living dead anthology in class. Okay. And one of the reasons that, that horror movies uh, exist is it's uh, Wes Craven said that they're boot camp for the psyche in a sense that uh -huh. for people who uh, are grew up, maybe especially like say an American who grows up in a safe sort of like suburban neighborhood who hasn't had anything that has shocked them into the real terror of the world. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, a safe way to do it. And it's a way yeah. to examine things that are wrong with society with, with uh, at the same time leaving it and not being permanently damaged. And it also releases the same sort of feelings you get from uh, a roller coaster. And there's usually two types of people. They either love roller coasters or love horror movies, but I've never really met people <laughs> who love both. I don't know, do I, you? I quite enjoy both. Uh, I can't do the ones that spin you around so much that you get sick to your stomach. But, uh, but I would, I would say I'm a roller coaster person. Yeah. Uh, within the limits of what my physiology will allow. <laughs> but uh, yeah. And that's what's, what's interesting to me about that is that there are movies that 
uh, like the, I think the first time I saw a Texas Chainsaw Massacre was probably mm. when I was like 16. Yeah. And I, and then I, I was like, oh, you know, I think that I was really nervous because when I was really little, I would get very scared of oh, horror yeah. movies. I remember Tales from the Crypt, a couple episodes of that. And I remember oh, no. uh, The Shining, Ooh. which I saw The Shining when I was probably like maybe 11 or 12 or something. And, yeah. and I just remember like these, it just like freaked me out, like really. Mm-hmm. But I still liked it, but it right. was like, but then I would have trouble going to sleep at night, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and and I remember being nervous in that way that like something gets really built up and uh, being like, uh, I don't know, I'm, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is going to be really scary. It's going to really mess me up. And then watching it and being like, oh, okay, this isn't really that big a deal. And then not seeing it for a long time and watching it again around like maybe like 10 years ago. And just being like, what the fuck? How yeah. did, like, I think I just didn't have enough life experience for that right. movie to be as upsetting as it really is. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah. it's definitely got adult themes to it that you don't catch when you're, you know, you're younger. You're just like, oh, she got away. And... Yeah, it, there's, there's like, I, I think that that is uh, like probably one of the, the rawest mm-hmm. horror movies that I've seen as far as something that is really just this is just straight up disturbing and yeah yeah, I just remember like seeing it as a teenager and being like you know oh look at all the bones this is cool like right yeah (laughs) right these people are weird I saw for the first time when I was 13 and I didn't understand what was happening but I actually ran like a mile like I just after the movie was over like I got up and ran because I had so much adrenaline from the movie that I just didn't know what to do with it and I was just like mom (laughs) Like just running, running, running. But yeah, no, I get it. It's uh, those kind of things that they leave you rattled when it's yeah. over. Um, yeah. But you know, I guess it's like it's sort of like um, you know, like a like a movie that's sad or a movie that leaves you with, I guess, the, what we, one would consider the 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 unpleasant feelings. They're they're you know, I, they serve a purpose. But I I can see why people are maybe not down with like a movies that all are like Night of the Living Dead where it ends and you're just sort of like okay uh yeah I, you know I, <laughs> which i mean i yeah there's movies that i respect as excellent works of art that i'll never watch again right uh, the, the one like the biggest one for me that i can think of is uh the road the uh-huh. um cormac mccarthy yeah uh brutal brutal I, I I don't think I've ever seen anything that really made me feel just like like full on depression for an extended period of time afterwards like that one and and mm-hmm. that movie really was like wow this is so well done I'm good for the rest of my life on this right one. I don't need to come back and because I used to rewatch movies like and and I don't really do it so much anymore but I used to just like put movies on while I was painting so there are movies that I've seen like you know. Uh, there are movies that I watched as a teenager like a whole bunch of times. Then there's a lot of movies that I've just kind of like ambiently experienced like yeah, many, many I, times. You know, I get that. Uh, but yeah, like there, there are those ones that are just such a bummer that I feel like uh, right. Just I do You're like the ending of Night of the Living Dead, but oh, uh, it's no, the ending's fantastic. It's a, it's a perfect film in every way. It, it is, an, it's an incredible film. I'm not. It is just the ending does leave you sort of like somebody just punched like right through your chest, yeah. and you're just yeah. like, yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it's like, and you know, honestly, I haven't watched that movie in some years, and now that I'm like kind of like remembering it, yeah, like it's pretty bleak. I, yeah. I think, uh. It's one of those ones, though, that, um, yeah, I mean, it's a classic for a reason. It's, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's in the Library of Congress for good, for good reason. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, it's just, but, you know, again, with, like, certain, your piece, like, Murderous Compulsion and, and uh, um, the uh, the thought, um, thought distortion, the, those mm-hmm. are just, and, and, and even your non-magic stuff, like, Terrible Weakness, these are such... Uh, like such good horror imagery um, that I feel you really are, you excel in. And I, I know I'm harping on it, but it's, it's something that as a horror nerd, I was just like, wow, this guy's, got, he's got that, like, he's got the eye for it. Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah. I mean, I, again, like a lot of it, I think is trying to think, think about like, why is this appeal to me? And, and like the things that you, that you brought up are all like 
definitely part of it, but there's still that feeling. It's it's like just trying to under it's or maybe it's like pointless to try and intellectualize like why we like the things we like beyond mm. a certain degree. It's just like it's you know, it's just interesting. But right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but then at the same time, I wonder, do you feel like a relief when you get like a guy as blessing uh assignment type assignment? Does that feel like um a, a shift from like because I'd imagine doing the heavier stuff, does that not sit with you when you have to work on a piece that's, you know, like I bleak that, itself? I think a lot of the heavier stuff feels almost like like a lot of it almost feels kind of operatic in a way that removes me from it, uh, from from feeling the the bad parts of it i think mm -hmm. okay. um and and so you know if if it's almost kind of like heightened to the to the point of like a movie or a stage play or something like that then then there's a lot of it that feels almost kind of like you're you're playing with this like gothic language and stuff like that that's really that's really kind of like fun um it doesn't necessarily feel thematically heavy to me and it, i mean it's rare most of my stuff is not like violent and i think that that's uh part of that too because the like i'm not super into doing stuff that is is like gory in the similar way that a lot of the movies that i'm into especially as a like you know older person than what i was into when i was a younger person uh i i'm less interested in the the violent stuff and more interested in the psychological stuff uh, which i mean can be just as it's, it can be just as as damaging i never I say damaging i mean be, in a sense sure that, well I, sure. I, don't, I don't mean it in a pejorative sense i just mean it in a sense of yeah. yeah it's and, like um like you were talking about like with mccarthy uh you know mm -hmm. and, yeah and but I, I think there are parts of that that um that are kind of like interesting to relate to that i mean i don't know they just don't to me, it just doesn't feel severe in the way that like something something like violent is. And I'm working on a project right now, which is a book. I, I don't know why this year all of a sudden like um, a whole bunch of illustrated books came my way, like all hmm. one on top of the next. And one of them is a horror book that I was really excited to be asked to be a part of um but there's i i don't think i'm allowed to say like uh, what the project yeah. is, but but there's parts of it that i feel extremely nervous about and um and that uh, like of, of any of these things like that's the one uh to me that is the most like what you're describing where it's like just just getting sitting down and kind of like i i'm at the point right now where i'm just starting to kind of like sketch my concepts and uh like i haven't even really presented any any concepts to the publisher yet and and it's like just that part is a lot harder than it normally is i think because of a little bit like what you're talking about like certain areas that i'm like i don't want to like i want to be honest and truthful to this chapter but there are parts of this that i don't want to paint like imagery that i don't want to paint because mm. i just feel like not good about it you know so right because the yeah it's it's uh that's that's the thing because i was talking with um when i talked to adam rex when and he did the paint that he said the piece of uh, for terror that he did he said that one left him like raw when he mm -hmm. was done doing it because watching this person go through an infinite loop of suffering uh where he's like vomiting his you know his, his self out and it seems like that would be tough but at the same time like uh you're you're gonna kick ass on that thing because if it's horror <laughs> i mean you're you're gonna do just fine i mean yes. it, it's <laughs> you'll i mean it you may be like you may be like shaking after it's over but uh, the the audience is gonna love it yeah i think also like once one the the hardest part for me um is always just kind of um planning planning the concept and the composition and there is a certain point where it transitions into craft and then i'm it, in the same way as like uh doing those figure studies and and nudes and things like that is like whether i'm like particularly interested in the subject matter or not it's just it's it's um practicing technique it's it's light and form and all those different things 
And if the subject matter starts to feel a little bit too heavy or, you know, I mean, I'm a commercial artist. Sometimes I end up uh, working on a job that I'm just not that passionately into. Um, but I can always passionately get into the craft of it. And so that might also be a kind of like way to to deal with the heavy feelings sometimes. It's just like, well, you know, we're just going to think about the the technical side of this and uh, just just really kind of like get into that and yeah, you know, and you, take some it, refuge there. And you really go into that. What I'm really I find impressive too is that you discuss um, – certain things that that not a lot of other artists are willing to talk about and your in your articles you talk about um the fact that some of your favorite pieces that you've done were rejected from from uh, clients for not you know for whatever reason which um and uh the fact that you also talk about um like political things on your facebook i mean it's just it's it's in, you're interesting in that aspect it's that i i i find that very informative because Nobody ever really does talk about that, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, what, what, what brought you, I mean, what gave you the courage to do that? I mean, I, I mean, honestly, as far as the political stuff goes, I think a lot of that is, I, I just get really inspired by my wife being very plain spoken about the things that she's passionate about. And she has really kind of helped me be, I guess, less concerned about you know like it's like is it important or is it not important if it's important talk about it you know mm -hmm. and um you know there, it's it's weird like i actually have kind of drifted away from social media uh to a certain extent lately so i'm like just not posting a lot of anything like i, I don't know when's the last time i've put any you know pieces up on facebook and instagram is pretty sparse lately but yeah uh, uh yeah and it's like um so so it's, it's sometimes there are things actually like there's something that uh i was thinking the other day like oh yeah i should i should put this link up for people because this might be something that people would find helpful and that's about um a resource for people who want to do more work on learning about anti-racism and uh like courses that are being offered in that and you know it's like that kind of stuff that uh and i should post that up probably um I don't know how long the gap is between recording these and airing these, but oh, um, uh, it, it will. There'll probably be plenty of time for you to get to get that up. But um, I was gonna say, so know. it'll it'll probably already have been something that I shared by the time that this comes out. But uh, but yeah, it's like sometimes uh, those things are things that I just kind of feel like, oh yeah, this is uh, really important to be talking about. It's not necessarily always easy to know like how much to be talking about it because I am also you know like becoming like better understanding the differences between performative and um, actually like you know doing things that are effective and and uh, you know for but but I do feel like regardless uh, sometimes just just kind of like, making it clear especially if you have any kind of like public following i you know relatively speaking don't think of myself as a very public figure but um you know i do have a certain number of like followers on my, you, on my you're account. you're a star you're a bit of a star it's okay but i you're mean like in a, in a very small pond <laughs> and uh but hey, even still yeah. you know i think it's, I mean, it's it's important to kind of like to, to just let let people know what you stand for and um and be ready to talk about it you know and i uh am a very non-confrontational person i get really uncomfortable i i rarely argue with people on the internet anymore <laughs> which yeah. uh i used to do a lot more and uh i i don't do a lot of it anymore but i still think it's important to you know kind of be uh you know talk about the things that are important to talk about mm -hmm. so. i i had not heard anybody so uh, eloquently uh discuss the artist boycott the way you did um and the fact that you uh, broached the topic of sexual assault i mean these are things that you know and, and for understandable Which, reasons like people may not 
want to, you know, maybe they, they're aware that it happens. So they don't want to maybe talk about it publicly for whatever reason. And I get that. That's fine. But I just thought it was very, um, it was yeah. very admirable that you were just sort of like, we're going to talk about this. And, and, and you said it in a way that I was like, okay, this I, is yeah, somebody who I knows. appreciate that. I, I, I just want to kind of like, uh, make a point to say that, that, you know, as far as the sexual assault issue goes, you know, I was really uh, stating my support of the people who are leading that conversation. Yes. But I'm yeah. not one of those people because, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm in a listening role as far as that goes. Like I, uh, I want to learn how to help. I want to learn, you know, where there's, there's so many parts of these problems that, um, I'm still becoming aware of things that I grew up completely like just just outside of my knowledge or, or personal yeah. experience. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, when it comes to like the artist boycott, I got feelings. You know, I'll talk about that <laughs> when it comes to, uh, you know, things that are that are not my own personal experience. Um, I, I want to be, you know in support of the people who are leading that conversation, but I'm definitely not going to present myself as someone who's uh, out there like talking about it because I, I'm, I'm still learning myself. Well, you, know? you as somebody who has worked, uh, worked with uh, the rape, uh, rain, the rape and incest national network and, and I, you know, for years and, and uh, you didn't, you, you certainly didn't say anything that was not 100% like on, on the nose, or at least you didn't re, uh, uh, re, I repost anything that wasn't. I just, I don't want you to feel like. That, no, no, uh, I appreciate it. I just, I, I don't want to come off different from you know what I mean? Like, oh, you know, you know. come like you're coming off. You're coming off just fine. Anybody who is who thinks otherwise is going to have to argue with me and I will win the argument. <laughs> um, so um, to sort of do a little bit of a pivot. Um, so like you, you, you're doing magic. You, you have this in, in, illustrious career. It's, I mean, it's, it's fantastic. And I know you say you're a star in small pond, but like it's it, when you think about the the type of success that you have as an artist, it is a statistical rarity and, and the fact that there's the two of you in one family it's mind-blowing three of you four of you. um but when did you get a, the call that you would be doing that cover of the italian rolling stone for bowie how does that oh how does that happen i mean <laughs> that was yeah uh boom yeah. that was a that was a weird one and that's a yeah i almost feel like i can't take any credit for that uh, what? for a number of reasons for a number of reasons um uh for one thing okay so to begin with like long time david bowie fan um so i was very excited to get to do it uh, right um but the the way that that job came to me was through my representative who uh mostly is bringing in work that's not genre work so I had already been doing, you know, magic cards and I had already been doing like a lot of the kind of like context that I have in publishing and fantasy and that kind of stuff uh, prior to uh, connecting with um, Richard Solomon artist representatives. And I've been with them now for actually uh, it's quite a number of years. Um, and it's just like every every now and then they pop in and they're like, hey, we got this, uh, somebody from the FDA is looking for an artist to do some art for a smokeless tobacco awareness campaign, you know, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. It's just like, it's the kind of stuff that I would never even know where to look for it. And I, I you know, like the, there's a lot of uh, editorial work that comes in from them. Mm -hmm. And so the Rolling Stone piece would be one of those that, you know, I could be out there kind of like pursuing that in the way that like I understand that industry uh, a little bit, but I, I just don't really know anybody in it for the most part. And so I mean, yeah. that work tends to, yeah, it, it, but that's like, that's what they do, you know, the yeah. uh, at Richard Solomon, like they have a long history with um, like the stuff that I've done for um, Scientific American and um, I've done a bunch of stuff for Texas Monthly, you know, like for places like that, a lot of that is coming through them because they have these kind of like long-standing relationships with these editors. I'm not exactly sure the Rolling Stone piece, like I don't know 
because uh, because it came through them like I don't know initially like how that ended up coming to me but they asked if I wanted to do it and I said yes but then it was like like I said I can't take a lot of like satisfaction in that piece because the story of that cover is that they uh I think it was when what album might have been coming out at the time he had a he had an album coming out I think and um they had a photographer shoot pictures and that was intended to be their cover and for whatever reason they felt like this isn't really uh quite right, right. so we're gonna we we own these pictures uh we're going to hire a painter to just paint one of these so that it's a painting like basically i was a filter you know right. what i mean like i mm -hmm. was i was a uh the the oil paint filter <laughs> in photoshop except we wanted to actually look good so we need to have a painter do it so so it was like a really fun job but like talk about like just getting into the 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 craft side of it it was like they sent me a photo and they're like here's exactly what we want you to do just turn it into a painting and make it look like one of your paintings and so yeah it was like super fun really cool and also like i feel kind of embarrassed whenever like it because it's like the easiest job in the world to, well, for somebody to just like give you a picture that was shot by a professional photographer and be like paint it <laughs> i mean yeah but you know at the same time i mean like if somebody handed me a photo of bowie and was like do it i'd be like "Ooh, yeah, yeah. And when and I, yeah and i'm not like uh it's, it's easy because like i have like you've mentioned like done I don't know thousands of paintings at this That's point. So like, many. Yeah. So th for me, like when I get a project, it's the the message side of it, the story side of it, and and the compositional uh, puzzle that that is involved, like finding the emotion of the piece. Like there's all these things that are very abstract that I think are really essential to making a strong piece, especially like a like a horror piece or any piece that has like a strong emotional response from the person looking at it. So, you know, it's like the technical stuff, I feel like, okay, that's really fun. But, you know, the the hard part is the the thinky part, you know, and mm -hmm. yeah, so so um, I don't know, like, and, and that's uh, maybe part of also one of the reasons why I started becoming less interested in the the figure like the nudes and figure studies um is because like i really initially like i started that project as a way to experiment with a different uh painting process and it transformed the way i work i am so happy that i that i did that because it really like not only evolved as its own thing but it completely changed the all my other work into this much more like painterly brushy Mm -hmm. uh, thing that that it hadn't been prior to that you know but at a certain point it's like well this is still kind of fun to experiment with and everything but you know I, I i started kind of feeling more like uh i think that i'm exercising my upper body and just skipping leg day yeah okay you know? yeah and and so it's, it's it's this kind of like i need to start focusing more on exercising my problem solving and and uh like emotional um messaging and 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 that kind of thing and so like yeah that to me at, at this point is much more interesting as a as a challenge and the technical stuff is is really fun to do but um it it does feel like i don't know maybe it just i feel more i have more of my 10,000 hours in on that yes stuff. yeah yeah and and what would be a, a is maybe a magic piece or if not magic uh, one of your like in, in general that you feel like had has the most narrative that you've injected into it i guess it would be it'd probably be better for you to name something that a client uh that commissioned because the, the restrictions help but what what's one that you're proud of that like really had a story that you injected into it that maybe not what maybe that wasn't there when it originally was assigned Oh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I feel like you got them in you. I'm telling you, man, I'm predicting that. Oh, like, no, one... I'm yeah, I'm I there's there's definitely ones that I'm really proud of in that respect. It's just that uh, there's this there's board game that I played a while back that uh, you 
um, flip over a card and and it'll say something like a fruit or something, and uh-huh. everybody has to like start naming the things. And it's and 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 the 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 game was like based on the psychological principle that sometimes you put someone on the spot and and you're just like, it should be really easy to think of, oh, like a well, yeah. hundred examples of this, but for some reason. I got nothing right now. It's you know? okay. That's fine. So. No, I get it. Metacognition is a thing, and I realize that I'm, I fire him at you, but it's, no, no, uh, but I, but no, I, it's it's a good question. I want to answer it. It's just that, um, like, I actually feel like I I almost do have a ready answer for that, uh, and then my mind just like it's goes, no goes look blank. I. I, it's not the first time that I have um I've question bombed a uh, subject and and because I just I get so excited and I and I'm sitting with this stuff like manic about it and then you know I come in and I explode um uh, you know what I'm gonna I I actually I keep and one of them was I think the one that I was trying to remember that didn't come to my head so uh, neither is magic uh, but uh, one of them is from the Marvel pieces. Um, those were really fun uh, because most of the characters I have grown up, you know, being a fan of, and some of the characters I was more familiar with than others. And there were definitely a bunch in there that I was like, "Who is this guy?" I got, <laughs> you know, I've never heard of Pip the Troll before. Let's look into that, you know. But um, but there was a couple of them that felt like kind of unusually high pressure, and one of them was Deadpool. Mm. And I wasn't like a huge Deadpool fan. I don't know if I ever really read many Deadpool comics or anything, but I just feel like I understand enough about the character to know that there's got to be this element of humor to the thing that for me, it was actually like, that was even more important than I, I, I did two Deadpool paintings and neither one of them is like an active scene. Like he's not fighting or anything. Yeah. Uh, he's like a, sort of in a, like a boudoir sort of set up in the one that's, 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 that's like... the one that, yeah. Uh, probably of all the pieces in the set i feel conceptually maybe the most proud of that one and it it was fortunate i had two years to work on that project because it was 135 paintings like you know it's going to take a long time to 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 produce all of this work and so i would work in batches where i was like uh you know laying out concepts for a couple dozen pieces and run those by the art director start doing my sketches start doing the finished paintings and then gradually like you know keep keep doing new concepts while i'm finishing these other paintings there was like things were happening kind of in parallel and i i think that both of the deadpools it it wasn't until at least a year into the project that i found an idea that i liked and for that one that you're talking about where he's yeah he's like sitting in his easy chair yeah uh with a portrait of himself that is the the Marilyn Monroe centerfold yeah. from Playboy. <laughs> yes. And and he's got his like his heart lollipop and his his like you know smoking jacket. And I get, yes. Yeah, there was like there was something about like I I, I don't want to kind of like ruin the good things about it for me by like d- describing it because it is more about like a joke than anything else. But, but oh it'll just, be it'll be on screen when we're talking okay, about yeah. it. Uh that 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 one really because I I kept like thinking of ideas that were like oh that's kind of that's kind of funny in a clever sort of meta way like I feel like a lot of Deadpool humor has a sort of meta yeah. kind of vibe to it but they would always be things like oh but I'm pretty sure that I remember seeing like when the movies were coming out that was part of the advertising for the movie you know so I I felt like I had to kind of like discard a lot of ideas before I found one that I was like I don't think I've seen this before. And I don't think I've seen it done like this before anyway. And so anyway, for whatever reason, I don't know, that one really felt like an achievement to me that I was like, oh, I got it. I got the, yeah, I got the, I got him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like when I saw it, I laughed and like, that's, that's, that's Deadpool. Like they just the like, I, I mean, and I, yeah, that makes sense. Cause I don't know. I, did you see the movies prior to? Cause that's, that I've seen I, the first, I, I didn't see the second one yet. Yeah. That's a lot to also like have in the back of your head too. Cause it was such a riotously funny movie. It, you, mm-hmm. you sort of, uh, you had a, to sort of have that on on your on your back as well as the actual <laughs> like graphic novels but yeah you you knocked it out of the park i saw that and i was just like I yeah was like, <laughs> and there's also there's a lot of really good artists who have done some really good stuff you know and i'm sure like there's there's a ton i've 
I've not seen more than a half scene, you know, like there's a ton of stuff out there that I'm just not even aware of. Um, but, but yeah, so that was, that felt good. Uh, the other one that um, was also from last year was a piece. So this was a commission, but it was a, a, a really open-ended uh, commission that was for um, Reckless Deck, which is a, I, do you know Reckless Deck? It's. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I know it in the, the research I've done, but. Like okay. I've never yeah the 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 concept of it uh Clark Huggins is the the guy who created it and his his concept was that he wanted to have like basically like um a deck of cards that you could like pull a bunch of random cards and it would like spark some ideas to like you know for for like if you like boy I want to draw but I don't know what I want to draw today so you'd like draw some cards and it would it would be things like you know, angel wings and uh, leather armor and uh, machine gun, you know, mm -hmm. and you'd be like, okay, I got to make a design a character that, that incorporates these different things. And so over the years, he's like evolved this in, like he's, he's put out expansions to kind of like broaden it out to like different genres and different, like just kind of like more and more tropes. It's all like tropes, you know, like yeah. take a you bunch know, of tropes. Um... Chuck Lucas says uh, does something with this thing that he made called the Genesis Generator that is of of the same vein where it, it just randomly pops up uh, uh, pops up different uh, like uh, ideas and and uh, I I actually did one of his which I, I won't I will cut this out later but we actually collaborated and I I had to do a a, a mushroom butterfly and it was like mine's just it, it's fun to watch the two of us together because. <laughs> Well, yeah. So, and 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 that's it's it's like a fun thing. I think there's a, a particularly, uh, like valuable way to use it also, which is to like get a bunch of tropes and then find a way to make them fresh. It's like combining things that don't normally go together. Right. Uh, is a starting point, but then you could even take that further and like like intentionally like jam things together that that don't work and try to figure out like how to make them work. Um, but I remember uh. Yeah, I don't know how it started. I remember Clark talking to me about that he wanted to do, like, we were, we were talking about um, storytelling at the LuxCon a couple years ago, and he was like, yeah, I really think it could be cool to do, like, a Reckless deck that's more about, like, uh, uh, not so much, like, you know, surface details, but motivational details and, and backstory and things like that, like, the ways that instead of just telling me what the character is wearing uh tell me who the character is like what's important to this character and then use that as a prompt to draw the character so I was like yeah that's really cool I, I like that idea and so um he later on contacted me he's like yeah so we're doing it we're making this <laughs> it's called psyche it's the new reckless deck uh it's all about like motivation and and uh character and he's like, I want you to, I want to commission a piece from you for the Kickstarter of it. Uh, and it's supposed to be like, I want it to be a piece that's about a character, but it's, it's a character that has more kind of like, um, more depth to them, I guess, than, than just like, you know, a warrior looking really cool, holding a big weapon, standing on right. a hill, you know? uh which are, those are fun to do you know but i was like okay um that sounds good and then it was like again it was it was like so i think a lot of the time like you mentioned like constraints uh being a thing that kind of are interesting to kind of like find solutions for having like a really broad uh like this could be anything any genre you know just so long as we can see the this kind of like that this this is a character with inner thoughts and it's like that's okay and i started sketching I'm like this is a lot harder than i thought it was yeah be. and uh but i'm really the the piece that i ended up with um i will send this to you if you need it uh is this one called the head can't know what the hand has done and, oh uh, yeah yeah that was uh the the i i know which one you're talking about it was in the um, recent muddy colors article yeah. yes yes it's the the woman with the the and the the the, the, the space with uh, beneath her with the the knife yeah um that's yeah yeah which you know and like not to get to because i don't a lot of the stuff i paint doesn't necessarily have like the personal significance a right, lot of right. it is more about 
like mood which is a different kind of personal significance i guess but it's not necessarily like i had a real specific idea right. with this you know so when i do have like a real specific idea and i feel like it it came off i'm like just kind of proud of it but also i'm like reluctant to talk about it too much because um sometimes i feel like i don't know if that uh takes away some of its but i don't think it does so yeah, uh for I, me I, <laughs> no i think there's a lot of i think there's a lot of artists who have that same sort of like protection or they want to protect it they're they're you know and, yeah. and I, I i get that i think well you know it's like i uh, to, to a certain extent i i kind of feel like it's real easy to pretend that stuff has significance yeah when it's, when it's just like actually it just kind of is like a bunch of stuff that looks cool but I don't really know what it means, you know? But in this case, like, um, it really does to me represent like this idea. And it's something, you know, at the time I was doing this painting was right when like uh, there was a lot of uh, protests going on last year. And there was a lot of like, you know, I've been trying to, you know, listen to and learn from uh, people whose experiences are outside of my own uh for for a while now but the more you learn the more you realize how much mm -hmm. you didn't know yeah and and that period of time of course like while all that was going on uh was was just like like a whole bunch more stuff that um really kind of was like god damn you know uh and so in a way like that painting to me is is about this idea of um because it's, it's not just about like racial justice, although that's kind of what I'm linking it to right now, but it's it's it also connects to me with at a certain point again like uh, following <laughs> following the lead of my wife who uh, is is just always ahead of me on <laughs> things, um, but uh, at a certain point kind of like thinking more about like the food that I eat and and where does it come from and you know how do I relate to that and things like that. Uh, thinking about just all the different ways that our actions can be harmful, even if we don't intend them to be. And even if, especially if we don't even know about it, because we're just not thinking about it because we don't want to think about it. And yeah. so for me, that painting is, you know, it's about this, this person who has constructed this kind of like, this barrier that protects them from knowing the, the, the harm that they're causing. And then there's this this gulf of nothing, and then there's the hand holding the the knife with the blood on it, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's it's this um, protective mechanism that I think we all have to to just uh, look the other way mm -hmm. from complicity. And, yeah. And anybody who's grown up, especially you know, uh, a white dude growing up in the United States. Has, has every incentive in the world to not think about the complicity of yeah. of all the bad things, you know. There's, and it's uh, cognitive dissonance is is, yeah. is 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 a real thing, and it happens to humans with brains. I mean, we just are we 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 don't want to have uh, we can't hold two separate belief systems, even though there may be uh, two of them in one idea, and then we flip our lids, we go with one, and then we just push yeah. it away. Yeah. And, and it's yeah, and it's it's so hard to deal with that stuff and and uh, and you know I think it just takes a long time of being willing to accept that that's going on to start to kind of actually even start to know what it is and uh, yeah and and so so I felt really good about that painting yeah. being something that I felt like connected to a lot of things to me like it's really hard as a realist painter to do work that is in any way connected to something that I feel is important, that doesn't feel ridiculously on the nose. And, um, you know, I'm not sure if other people look at this painting and understand or think about any of that stuff. And in a way, I almost kind of feel like that, I'd, I'd rather it be something that people feel some kind of emotion, emotional connection to without necessarily knowing like the literal meanings of things because then it might speak to them in a more personal way 
Um, I feel that, well, if I give my, my initial impression of it was, while that was not what I got from it, there was, I was mystified by it the same way that you talk about how you respond to certain horror films where I, I was like, I'm not sure what I'm, I'm think I'm not sure what I'm thinking, but I'm, I'm feeling something. And mm -hmm. I, I, I wondered, is that an actual, is that a line from a book? I mean, the, the name of it itself, it's, 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 uh, is that, is that something that you, you penned yourself or is that, yeah, is that, that's, it's, it's really rare that I come up with a title that I feel I actually like. That's one of them. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, and that's right there. That's why I'm like, honest to goodness, I, I feel like you, are gonna end up writing a screenplay and directing something it's just it's gonna happen <laughs> i tell i'm telling you i'm telling you i i see it happening i predict it i, I call it now and it will be happening and i shouldn't have hit my desk because i got too excited but um yeah no i that's that's what that's what's cool about uh your your evolution as an artist is that you are you're i can see now that you're veering into that and what's really great is that I watch, I'm the kind of person who watches audio commentaries on DVDs so I can find out what the directors meant to do when they did it. And I feel like you can actually have your, your take on it. You know, you watch your, mm -hmm. your, you see your, your take on it and then you listen to what the creators intended. And then if it, if it gels with you, cool. And if it's something different, I mean, there's room for both. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's, it's sometimes it's weird. Like you get really harsh about yourself on things that i like that when other people do that you know right but it, yeah it feels weird to do it myself i also just don't feel most of the time i don't feel like i'm that kind of artist you know uh that that has any kind of like social message or anything in my work uh mm -hmm. i wish i did more than i do um i mean there's probably like you know who, who points of view come across but um you're pretty but, young yeah. i mean like I've, you know <laughs> what i mean like in object i mean like if you look at i mean you because you hit the ground running i mean how old are you again like you're like i am you, 38 so. yeah see so like you have all of this under your belt at 38 and i mean like you're not even at midlife uh yet so i i think that you've like you could easily be that that artist. It's just like now you're transitioning. I, I'm I'm just mm -hmm. saying. I I feel like you you have that. I'm just saying. I, I see it. I see it happening. I see something brewing, and and it's only because I feel I'm objectively seeing it. I'm just like, yeah, he's got a, he's got a he's got a screenplay that's gonna happen. It's just because you, you you with the photography, <laughs> you're, with the art, the photography, it makes sense. It just yeah. It, it, you know, it's it's I've I appreciate that. Uh, I love um understanding how story works for some reason i'm always like i i i think there's maybe it's just that there's a certain comfort in being a technician on other people's projects mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. uh maybe it's a, a like a fear of failure thing or something but it's like you can kind of remove some of that responsibility right uh from your own shoulders and and be like i'm just gonna do my job well um but it is it's it's fun to get into that stuff sometimes uh yeah I it's, definitely, it's, it's really hard <laughs> i yeah well i think i mean be, i'd say be open to that and you know and even if you don't want to write something i'm like it, you you probably know a couple of people here and there who are good at writing it and, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so I, there's no there's no um there's no sh short there but like it's just it's my prediction and i and i i feel compelled to to announce it to I, the the tens of dozens of people that will be watching my interviews. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate it. It's it's inspiring <laughs> to kind of like, I don't want to usually think about that, but that's fun to think about. So, yeah. I mean, it seems like a, a progression and um, and I won't keep you much longer. Um, But before we go, I want to ask one more about which I just think, which as far as narrative go and which must have been a, a, a like a kaboom. It was just crazy how it happened. Totally lost. Did you see that coming uh, when it happened? I mean, no, I would have not sold the painting as cheap as I did. <laughs> oh, if no. I had. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! I, no. I, I, I'm I really happy that the the buyer who bought it is, got a is deal. who they are. Uh, I'm glad for it to be in that collection. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm like remarkably bad at predicting which pieces of mine are gonna be like you know. The, a hit. <laughs> yeah. And and totally lost. I mean, I don't think that anybody could have predicted it. It was it was such an interesting assignment. It was sort of like, you you, I mean, 
cute is not something that usually is is thrown at any magic the gathering artist in general you know like they don't get like they don't get that kind of chance then yeah you, you know and then all and of a sudden you yeah i like doing cute uh i don't get to do it very often um the the other one that was more recent than that was um oh what was it called it's i have you mentioned having like some originals this guy I forget the name. I sometimes I can't remember the names of the cards, but oh, 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 the oh, uh, clock. Oh, uh, 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 damn it, clock. It's got clock in it. I'm gonna. I'm gonna just, clock, I'm, I will cut this out later because I look like an asshole. Um, but but uh, well, uh, let me like you know. I'm actually just look it up. Um, here real quick. Okay, yeah, clockwork um, servant. <laughs> yeah, and and that one uh, was one where like when I got the brief for that, it almost felt like. Uh, like I knew it wasn't going to be another totally lost because I think there are specific things about totally lost that that made it work the way it did. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, but it was a similar feeling of like I never get to do like a fun little dude for magic. Yeah, and, right. And this is a fun little dude. I'm excited about this. Like I was really psyched about that. But with I think with totally lost there was this weird combination of um, uh, you know whatever connection people had with the the feeling of the art uh but also i i to me i feel like that card is fairly useless uh yeah. like i don't think it's really playable no and then the the name the uh the fibble the, the name that's given to the character yeah. in the flavor text i think it was this thing that is like this combination of these three things that that created this weird like like memeish quality about yeah. him I don't he, know. It it was it was crazy because it's one of the rare instances in magic where the art uh and the flavor eclipsed the actual function of the card. Yeah. Like it, it became it became famous enough on its uh, like which is it's a pretty rare occurrence. It's actually pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but but people just really identify. I think that I mean let's, let's face it as magic players we are we all identify like feeling nervous in a crowd and not you know like we, we, we yeah. all social anxiety is not a is not a strange uh it's not a, it's not a foreign feeling for magic players right. I, <laughs> so we we i think fibble is sort of we see ourselves in him in his eye i remember uh, i just want to look at look at the piece again real quick here to, yeah yeah okay it's like i want to make sure i'm remembering it right i remember um reading a there there used to be these uh how to draw comics things i think this was like going back to like wizard magazine uh and they had this like uh feature like a like a column and in, in every issue that was like drawing lessons basically and i remember there was this one that was talking about uh emotion and how you can um how you want to like really like pose your characters so that we can read their emotion and and one of the examples it gave was uh shatner from star trek that when shatner feels pain the way that he like crunches up and it's like like his elbows crunching in and you know and it's something about this like silly oh my little God. thing that i read forever ago like stuck in my head and i think oh. like when i was working on totally lost like i was thinking about that like that like cringy, <laughs> you know, kind of like just just like hunch on in like that. Uh -huh. But yeah, it's hysterical. Oh my god, that's great! <laughs> like William Shatner, he's like he inspired Fibblethip and the Michael Myers mask. I mean, like <laughs> that's just. I mean, if that's not if that's not um if, if that's not legendary, I don't know what is. <laughs> <laughs> that's great oh my god i could totally see it too it's like now when i look at films i'd be like shatner <laughs> um that's funny um well the last one that i'll ask you is um i always like to ask this um how many i know you can't do the specifics of of, of what they are but um how do you have any pieces in the upcoming sets how many you got coming and uh also anything else personal that you would like to to announce that you can announce yeah um let me answer that accurately for you. Uh, not a lot coming up, but I do have uh, currently three finished pieces that are in some intermediate stage of production right now that mm -hmm. will be coming up in, in new sets. Uh, another one that I just got sketch approval on. Um, so I'm 
back into it, uh, I took a lot of time off when I was doing the Marvel pieces. And um, so I'm just kind of uh, slowly getting like back into the into the magic thing. And, and because of these uh, illustrated novel projects that I mentioned, even then I'm like, you know, doing a pretty yeah. low workload on magic. You, but, like uh, you say time off, but it's not, it, it just well, took from, yeah, right. Like, what you're like hiatus from right, that. Right from that brand uh but yeah uh and um yeah the, the main thing that's got me busy right now is is these illustrated books though uh i've got four underway one finished from earlier in the year uh and a sixth one that is being discussed that is probably going to be i'll be working on that next year so so like that's a lot of um it's weird. It's I, I've done a bunch of these before. Like the you mentioned Salem's Lot. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I've got behind me the uh, Farseer trilogy for um, uh, Folio Society, which is the most recent published one that I've done. And altogether, I think I've actually done like a dozen illustrated novels. Um, so it's it's like fun to do. One of my one of my biggest inspirations as like. Uh, of, of like illustration history is N.C. Wyeth's Treasure Island, which um, love those paintings, love that series. Uh, I live pretty close to the the museum where you can go see. They don't oh. have all of them, but they have like most of the originals on display. And wow, um, it's it's just like there's a real feeling when you walk into that room. They're they're big. They're like thirty by forty each wow. one of those paintings. And and when you walk in, and they're just like lining the walls you know it's it's really cool and so i've always been like really into that kind of project and so uh yeah i don't know what it is that all of a sudden in like um january of this year like it was like within the space of two or three weeks like all these different publishers uh were like are you are you available for this and luckily the deadlines of all of them were were in such a way that i could kind of say yes to most of them uh and so that's really fun i don't know if i'm allowed to say what any of them are as right are. right but, yeah uh two of them are for books that had been that are that are pre-published one is like an old classic one of them is a fairly recent uh book but it's been around for a few years and then the other two is really unusual are for uh first publication um, which is really weird for for illustrated novels. Wow. Um, but I think it's cool that uh, I, I guess maybe that's something that some uh, like indie publishers are starting to get into doing more. Of. That's that's so, cool. I, yeah. You know, you talked about that, too. And, and the way you put it in your one of your articles was really spot on was that with this, these editions that that are released, you don't get to actually see the artwork until you buy it. And so the artwork is the reward and, and uh, that you get when you open it up. So like, that's, uh, that's sort of like, um, that, that's cool. That, that's, uh, that, yeah. it shows a lot of, um, a lot of faith in, in the work. They must really believe that what they're doing is, is gonna, is gonna knock it out of the park, which is, yeah, you know, it's, I, I, it's you nice know, to see. I, I, I see. So a couple of them are for uh, clients that I've done similar projects with before. And a couple of them are people that are, it's my first time working with them, but they're all, in some stage of happening and uh so that's fun it's it's like i think a good part of the rest of my year is going to be probably working on these but still having time to like you know get a magic card in there get a get a book cover in there you know so these other things that come along I, i'm <laughs> yeah. still able to take those on too but uh but yeah and it ultimately i i really want to be putting time into doing more ritual paintings um and that is, there is a thing that that's heading towards. Uh, I need to be more disciplined about oh, man, having, yeah. having, having time blocked off for that because it's, it's that kind of like, it's always like, oh yeah, that's like next year that'll, and it's always next year, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's it, it it eats at you because it's uh the pieces that that you are like sort of like haunted by, right? If they if you don't get them out, they're not gonna leave. It's interesting that there are 
because like I, I lay out concepts for those sometimes and then uh, just kind of like sit on them for a while and then come back to them. And if I still like it, then it's worth doing. Like there are, there are a lot that I've um, gotten it to the point where I could sit down and I'm like two days away from having a painting. Uh, but it's like, okay, I'm gonna, you know, come back to this in a couple of months because, you know, it's, there's no ticking clock. And when I come back to it, I'm like, eh, no, got to keep messing around with this, or I don't like this idea anymore, you know? So when I, when I do come back, if, if I still like the idea that I feel pretty good about that. Um, so I do have like a bunch of uh, potential paintings sitting there that I was just looking at the other day, like looking back through my sketchbooks and being like, okay, yeah, I think, I think these are ready. Now it's just a matter of like sectioning off the time and, and making it happen, so. Right. Exactly, yeah. yeah, and and the these will also be the eventual like great film that you will think that's it's a just very elaborate storyboarding is what I'm gonna say. So, um, but I'm I kid, but like seriously, I I I, I you you are very impressive with your your just like basically I think you are an artiste. It's just sort of like, I mean, I you know, congrats. I I, I thank you. This has been like a, a very flattering. Uh, conversation so oh well thank you I mean I, I, I and I mean and I, I mean it it's it comes it comes from an honest place I mean like I I as much as I would love to to be uh like that kind of ass kisser I I can't I can't pull it off if I'm not if I'm not behind it and I I I, I see your stuff and I was just like yep it's like I I see it happening and and uh I'm not wrong with this kind of stuff just, I'm I'm good I'm wrong with like everything else in my life but this kind of stuff you know I, I appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. Well, it's been great talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Likewise. All right. You have a good day. You too. Bye. All right. Bye. Was I not right about David? I will say it again. Putain du talent. Putain du talent. God, everything sounds better in French. No, really. It's insane. I could say, j'ai la théorie or trou du cool palou. Or, okay, how about this one? Digression alert. Manja de la merde. Well, thanks for checking in, mis amis, but until next time, je dois ramasser.